Good afternoon. Welcome to the next of our series of sessions for the Ohio Roundabouts Conference. This is Victoria Beal, and I'm so happy to have all of you with us. Today, we're privileged to have Ken Sides, um, and he's with Sam Schwartz Engineering, and Ken has a long history roundabouts. He's also recently provided some NHI courses for us, and we are so pleased to have him as a presenter for you, not once but twice today, on two different sessions for the Roundabouts Conference. So before I turn things over to Ken, I just wanted to mention that we have a handout in the handout panel for you, so please feel free to download that. If you are not able to for some reason, um, don't worry, I will send out an email link to it later. Also, if you haven't had a chance yet, if you could please drop a hi or hello in the question box so I know that you found it, because that is how we're going to be accepting questions for Ken throughout the presentation. And I see that Jean Russell was the very first one to put a, a hi or hello in there. So thanks, Jean, for that. We love having you on the session. Um, I don't believe there's anything else I have housekeeping-wise, so I'm going to turn things over to Ken. Are you ready, Ken? I am. Thank you, Victoria, for that nice introduction. And welcome, everybody, to Whereabouts to Put the Roundabouts. Maybe you already have some ideas. And I'm going to apply, uh, supply a few more that you may or may not have thought of, because roundabouts are turning out to be incredibly versatile and applicable to all sorts of site situations that people are doing in the United States that I, I never would have thought of, and if I did, I, I probably wouldn't have dared even suggest them. And I'm going to try to make it easy for you by showing you some real simple tools to figure out if the site, very quickly, if the site is even uh, appropriate and feasible. So let's get started. A word about me. Um, as Victoria mentioned, I'm an engineer with Sam Sports Engineering at our Tampa office. Our headquarters are in Manhattan, we have offices in Chicago and Washington, D.C., and on the West Coast. And I've been involved uh, mostly as the owner's project manager in modern roundabouts, constructed modern roundabouts since 1998, and so about three dozen or so and counting. So the first tool, number one, I'm going to show you is so simple. I call it the drive-by screening tool. Uh, of course, you don't have to be driving. You could be bicycling, but all you need is a set of eyeballs. So what you don't need is to have a study performed. You don't need any fancy modeling software or any software. Don't need no consultants and don't need to find funding for consultants. And you don't need permission from your boss or anybody to do the drive-by screening tool. And it'll get you pretty far along the road. So let's take a look. Here's an intersection uh, in Florida. It's got an uh, old-time gas station there, as you can uh, see in that lower left photograph. And you're driving by, and you put eyeballs on it because you want to see not how many lanes are at the intersection, but how many lanes these streets are. And both of these streets are two lane streets. Okay, you have to look back a little bit from the intersection to get away from those extra turn lanes and sometimes extra through lanes that you frequently find at intersections. And we'll look at some of those uh, in a few minutes. So we took a look and um, if you have a two-lane street intersecting a two-lane street, uh, more than likely a one-lane modern roundabout can handle the existing volume. So let's take some examples. You have two lanes, by two lanes, by two lanes, by two lanes at, at each of the four legs. It could be a three-legged intersection as well. Okay. If one of the uh, lakes is two lane divided, meaning it has a median, that'll work fine as well. Or if two or three or all four legs are divided and have medians. In fact, that's even better because if you have a median, then you may not have to buy any right of way to put in a one lane modern roundabout, one circulating lane. So if the existing volume uh, is being handled by the existing intersection, uh, more than likely, 
a modern roundabout would also handle existing volume. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of intersections that you will see all the time as you drive by that are actually well below uh, capacity. So for sure, uh, almost uh, one lane modern roundup uh, can handle that. So right now, you know, nine intersection configurations, uh, you can uh, find a pretty, pretty likely good candidates for modern roundabout just by driving by. The same thing would be true if they were three lane intersections. Uh, this is a total of nine here, including if uh, one, two, or all three uh, of the legs happen to be divided, that's even better. So if you have four lanes intersecting two lanes, um, and chances are a, um, a um, two-lane modern roundabout can handle the existing volume of these, uh, especially if the existing volume is below capacity for the existing intersection. Of course, you do have to think about uh, future volume. But um, so right here are uh, another nine intersection configurations that could be handled. And uh, by the way, if you don't need all four lanes on that four lane street, maybe it was overbuilt, uh, you could taper down to two lanes uh, in advance of the intersection. And now you're looking at two lane street by a two lane street. So keep that in mind as well, because there are a lot of two lane streets, United, uh, four lane streets in the United States that don't need and never did need, and maybe in the future won't need to be four lanes. So keep that in, in mind, uh, mind as well. And of course you have four lanes by four lanes, again, with or without medians on one, two, three, or all four legs. And again, a three-way intersection possibility, a T intersection. There's nine more intersection configurations that probably are good for a two-lane modern roundabout, more than likely. So I have just taught you how to spot 27 different existing configurations that can probably be handled by a modern one or two lane modern uh, roundabout, especially if the existing volume is below capacity of the existing intersection. Now, wasn't that easy? You didn't have to do a study, didn't have to hire a consultant. You didn't have to ask your boss if you could do it. You can do it today on the way home. So, but it uh, actually, it can be even better than that. Let's look at a pretty interesting example in downtown Asheville. This time, we're going to count the lanes that are connecting to the intersection. All right. So this is the typical downtown intersection or suburban intersection anywhere in the United States. This happens to be right around the corner from the county building and the city hall building. And um, as you can see, it's not pretty. It doesn't lend itself to economic development, which is what they wanted for their downtown in order to have a vital downtown. You have to have pedestrians at daytime and nighttime, which means you have to have a pedestrian friendly environment if you want to have economic vitality in your downtown. Intersections like this are not pedestrian friendly. They're not really motorist friendly either, which we'll get to. So what to do about it? Well, first of all, uh, for fun, let's count how many connecting lanes there are. Oh, I count seven turn lanes and 11 through lanes for a total of 18 connecting lanes. Who would want to walk across that at lunch hour to get a bite to eat? And the thing is, restaurants cannot survive on lunch. Nobody wants to pay very much for lunch, and there's uh, no alcohol sales at lunch, which is where a lot of the profit is in restaurants. They, restaurants, in order to survive and be downtown at all, have to have a dinner hour with people there. So if downtown is set up so that it can empty out at five o'clock sharp and become a people-free desert, those restaurants cannot survive at night. So this is all about economic vitality and a bonus is better operational efficiency and greater pedestrian and bicyclist friendliness. So let's take a look at what Asheville did. I hope you go to Asheville uh, next summer.
if it's safe, and visit this intersection and watch it operate. Somebody came up with this concept for that intersection. Whoa. The idea is that if you did put in a modern ground dot, you could have landscape medians, which the business community wanted, and you could have angle parking, more parking, which the business community has to have if they're going to have economic vitality. Or you could stick with what they have, lots of asphalt, not very pretty or friendly. So there it is. Do we need all those through lanes? Do we need all those turn lanes? Maybe not. Here it is. Let's take a look. Pedestrians have to cross six lanes. Who wants to do that daytime or night? Um, and uh, maybe we don't need all of these lanes, perhaps. Same thing for the cross lanes, which are not shown. So, uh, so those are some turn lanes. Well, roundabouts don't have any turn lanes. So if this were a modern roundabout, there would be no turn lanes, which after all, turn lanes are just storage lanes, right? That's where we store vehicle, vehicles until it's their turn to turn. Uh, so these are really storage lanes and modern roundabouts have no need of storing cars that are going to be turning. But also, uh, there's a through lanes here too. And you know, you may not need all the through lanes that are at the intersection. Uh, cars queue back from the red lights in the through lanes, do they not? And we don't want those vehicles to queue back to the next intersection. That would not be good. So a lot of times you'll see extra through lanes at the intersection. <clears throat> just to store the cars while they wait their turn to go forward and make their through movement. So again, more storage that you don't need at modern roundabouts. But is there enough space here? I mean, good Lord, you want to sandwich a one lane modern roundabout into this space and will it handle the traffic volume? So we don't need those lanes. Uh, if it could be a roundabout, and this is what the concept is. You can see where the buildings are, they're in the same place, okay. But that's just a rendering, just a rendering. Oh, look, we even get bike lanes under this rendering, this concept. Wouldn't that be cool if it were possible? So uh, could this really happen here? Well, the answer is, could it be greener, more business friendly, and a lot more pedestrian downtown? And there it is, Asheville, North Carolina. Replace that conventional intersection with 18 connecting lanes with a one lane modern roundabout. And so pedestrians have only one lane to cross. They have a nice refuge at the Splitter Island. And look, we even have a bike lane and a bike ramp. As you probably know, um, confident bicyclists can claim the lane as they approach the roundabout and claim the lane in the circulating lane as they circulate and you be able to bicycle faster than the circulating motorized traffic actually. Or bicyclists have the option of transitioning on that ramp you see from the bike lane to the sidewalk system. So they did it. How did it operate? Well, I watched it operate for a little while, uh, mid-afternoon. It's congested, uh, and it was congested beforehand, and downtown is expected to be congested. Uh, that's okay. It was flowing freely, and, and very quietly, too, I might add, and uh, it was not hard for pedestrians to find gaps to cross. Very nice. So check it out yourself uh, next time in, your Ash in Asheville. Don't take it from me. So, and that's what it looks like now overhead. So this intersection used to look like this because it didn't have that bypass lane, okay? And now it looks like this. So there are a lot of intersections that could be converted to one or two lane modern roundabouts or hybrid modern roundabouts. And this is what the approach looks like now to that intersection, all right? So that's your uh, drive-by uh, screening tool. 
This went from 18 connecting lanes to eight lanes connecting at the intersection. What a difference. And of course, this landscaping is going to grow up. It's altogether a much better place for their economic development goals, but also for pedestrian and bicyclists and skater safety, as well as safety for youngsters and oldsters. Uh, what's the primary characteristic of older persons who are pedestrians? They walk slowly, right? Not all, but many do. And should any of us ever age, we too may be walking slowly. That means the longer the crossing distance exposure, the longer the time exposure. And unlike us, our aging parents cannot break into a run to finish the crossing if they realize they have misjudged the approach speed of approaching high-speed traffic. And of course, there is no high-speed traffic at modern roundabouts. Let's took, like, take a look at uh, Ken's screening tool number, view, number two. This really isn't mine. It's been around for a long time. But if you look at the total number of volume uh, of vehicles uh, into an existing intersection, if it's between 20,000, if it's less than 20,000 vehicles per day, chances are quite good a one-lane modern roundabout would work there. If you don't mind congestion, now or in the future, even 25,000 vehicles per day now or in the future uh, would suffice for a one-lane roundabout would suffice for that. If you have higher Can volume, yes. We have a question that came in to the chat pod. And it's concerning oh, yeah, me, the, Ash uh, the Asheville. Yeah, yeah. So that Asheville, the truck apron looks pretty wide for a downtown area. Why was this needed? Well, it doesn't look all that wide to me. A little bit, maybe. Um, I'm not privy to that, but I can tell you more that, that that would be a function that would be driven by the design vehicle. This may be designed for uh, semi-tractor trailers to go through. That would be my guess. Or perhaps they occasionally have uh, specialized trucks or um, maybe even agricultural equipment. Uh, I don't know. But I don't think that... Um, school buses or city buses or fire trucks or single unit uh, trucks will need that truck apron. When you see a, a truck apron that's wide or seems on the wide side, that's got to be the reason. And that gives you an alternative to making a larger inscribed circular diameter ICD, and that is the distance from one curb like say right here, or outside edge of the circulating lane to the other outside circulating lane. So if you don't want the roundabout to be too large, which would be higher speeds, or you just simply don't have the space, uh, then you can make for a wider truck apron. And you also could even have uh, mountable curbs on the outside, uh, such as here or here, for example, if you need to in here. So you do have some design options, and I refer you for the present to NCHRP 672, second edition. Third edition will be out next year, and you can also see what other people have done. Um, and this brings up a point, Victoria, I mentioned, emphasized in the beginning. Please uh, interrupt. We have lots of time. Please interrupt me with questions. Um, do it. Right away, you don't, there's not going to be a break for questions, so we'll, we'll have time at the end, but it's better to jump in uh, at the moment. Please feel to interrupt with uh, content contribution. Maybe you know about a similar uh, site uh, somewhere else in Ohio or someplace you've seen and you'd like to comment on it, that would be great. Also, please interrupt if you have an opinion, an informed opinion or even an uninformed opinion. Um, please don't be shy. You have a couple of ways to do that. One is to type it in the chat box, and in which case, uh, Victoria Bill will interrupt me and read it as she just did. Uh, but you can also raise your hand, I think, with this software or, or indicate in the chat 
that you'd like to her to unmute your microphone so you can uh, state state your question. Um, so that is fine as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. So um, if you exist, if you happen to know the uh, <clears throat> the volume at the, your existing intersection uh, and it's uh, less than 40,000 vehicles per day, then uh, the odds are pretty good that um, the a two-lane modern roundabout will handle that uh, for today's volume. You can look at future volumes, uh, or even as many as 4, 45,000 vehicles per day <clears throat> now or in the future. That's going to be a little bit more congested. That is going to be a more congested um, two-lane modern roundabout at peak hour. But hey, peak hour is all about congestion, and a congested modern roundabout. Uh, actually can function quite well. Um, and we'll discuss that um, in the, uh, the metering webinar coming up after this. So um, you may find it perfectly acceptable to have a congested uh, modern roundabout, and uh, depending upon the context in the site, because remember, um, you, the intersection probably is congested anyway if it has that kind of volume as a conventional intersection. And remember also, you get tremendous safety benefits as well as operational benefits uh, with modern roundabouts. And I do mean very large safety benefits. I think many of you already know that. Okay, screening tool number three. You are going to need some instrumentation for this, and you've got it in your pocket or on your desk right now, your cell phone. But you don't need a cellular connection. You don't need a Wi-Fi connection. You don't need no consultant and funding for a consultant, and you don't need permission from your boss or anybody else to do the number three screening tool. All you need is your hey, cell Kevin. phone. It's Yes. I'm going to interrupt again. There's a question about um, in screening tool number two, they wanted to know what peak hour factor are you assuming? Well, you can crank that in. This is like a really quick and dirty screening tools. Um, if you want to spend a few extra minutes, uh, you can look at your seasonal adjustments. You can look at uh, the number of trucks you have, and you can uh, quickly refine these bounds uh, with just a little bit more minutes, a few more minutes time. Um, and then if you want to get even more elaborate, uh, you can go to spreadsheets and uh, and software. Um, you can use uh, Synchro or Visum uh, or Sidra to model the existing intersection and uh, a modern roundabout to replace it or a brand new intersection, uh, which could be either conventional or modern roundabout. So for each of these, um, quick, dirty, uh, screening tools, you can go a little bit deeper with table lookup or further deeper with spreadsheets or even uh, software modeling tools. But what I'm showing you here is you don't need any consultants or special studies for, and they're so easy to do, you don't have to ask your boss, hey, do you mind if I spend two or three days looking at this? You can do it on your uh, own at your desk or at home. So, um, good question. Thank you. For that. Anyway, you don't need um, a connected phone because actually all you need is the calculator that's built into your software. And all the math you need to do is simple addition, as you see right here for uh, screening tool number three. And I'm going to show you an actual example. Now, you will need turning movement counts for this screening tool. What? You don't have any? Don't worry. You don't need a traffic tech. Don't need no consultant and funding for it, and you don't need permission because all you have to do is look for that uh, turning movement uh, counting box, uh, turning movement counter uh, that uh, is somewhere around the office, uh, and you can go down to this interesting intersection yourself and count uh, turning movements during peak hour. You don't have to have a tech do it. Oh, can't remember where the turning movement counter is, which closet is sitting in, that's okay. Maybe your office doesn't even have one and you don't want to borrow one from another office. You can simply use a pen and paper. This is a form for uh, the Florida DOT and there are other forms just like it. 
It's not very difficult. So again, you can proceed yourself with screening tool number three. So you've got your turning move accounts either because you looked them up um, or you went and got them yourself, or maybe you just made them up um, kind of because you sort of know that intersection anyway because you drive through it every day. Anyhow, you've got your turning movement uh, for an intersection, and what we want to do is uh, interpose these on a roundabout to see uh, what would happen. So in particular, we want to know how many vehicles there are going to be at each of these uh, boxes. For example, this box here on the right is the volume of vehicles entering uh, on this leg, the uh, east leg. Now, if this were one of my classes, this would be a sheet of paper, and you would write your name right up here above the word name, and we would do the exercise. But since that isn't the case, let's do it together now on the phone. Uh, here we go. I'm on the phone. I'm on the computer for my audio connection. So there are the four places where we can record the volume of vehicles entering. Okay. So what have we got? Well, let's do this one first. Those cars are going to be entering on this leg, correct, and turning right. And those vehicles are going to be entering on this leg and going straight through, correct? And these vehicles are going to be entering at this intersection and turning left. So let's add them up, just like we did. And uh, there it is. That's the number that goes right here. Not too hard, was it? Did you have to ask your boss if you could do it? No. Did you have to hire a consultant? No. Did you have to get some fancy modeling software? No. So now you know how to do all four of these, all right? Let's take a look at the circulating traffic at each point between legs of the intersect. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the exiting traffic at each leg. So this uh, uh, is the traffic exiting on this leg to the north and so forth. So we'll do the same thing. We wanna look at that. And let's see, these vehicles up here are going to have to pass that point uh, and exit on this leg, correct? So we got those. Um, these vehicles will not be exiting on the north leg, and these vehicles will not be exiting the north leg. They're going to exit down here. What about those? Yes, that through traffic is going to be exiting on the north leg. And you probably already guessed that left turn turning traffic over there is going to be exiting on the north leg. So let's add them up. Just like we did on the phone a minute ago, there's our total. And so that's the correct answer. Now you know how to do all four of those. Now, why do we want to know this information? Well, the reason we want to know this is because we want to know how many lanes of traffic we're going to have, to, how many travel lanes we're going to have to have at each of these points. Why do we care about the number of lanes? Because that determines. Um, whether it's going to have one circulating lane or two circulating lane roundabout or a hybrid modern roundabout. And the number of lanes, circulating lanes, also tells us how much room we're going to need, how big the footprint is going to be, which tells us whether or not we're going to have to buy some land. So you can get a lot out of this exercise with the calculator in your cell phone. Okay, that was easy. Now let's look at the volume of traffic that's going to be circulating at uh, between the legs, uh, or I'm sorry, at the legs, uh, but circulating traffic at each of these four points in the modern roundabout if there were to be one here. So let's look at this one first. Well, those 415 cars are going to have to circulate right past this point, correct? Going by this uh, north leg. Yep. Okay. And these 105 vehicles that are turning left are also going to have to circulate uh, past this point, correct? All right. And these vehicles here, the 152, are eventually going to have to circulate uh, past this point here. So uh, let's add those up. That's what was on the calculator. Very easy. That's correct. And now you know how to do all four of these. And that is your super simple screening tool number three. All right.
So now you can get into a little slightly more advanced. There are tables available. Uh, these are this table is reproduced, I believe, in CHRP 672, which I recommend to you. And it gives you some rules of thumbs. Remember, you can push it a bit if you don't mind congested peak hours now or in the future. Uh, and by the way, if you're going to need two lanes in the future, the the common recommendation now, you may already know this, is to not build both lanes now. Instead, design your roundabout for two lanes, but also design it so that only one lane, the inner lane, is built now. But move your utilities out so that if you do have to add a second circulating lane in the future, it, you won't have to rip up uh, too much of the stuff you installed when you built the one lane roundabout because uh, you never know that future traffic may never arrive. We'll see, or it uh, might arrive sooner than uh, we thought. So you've got some little lookup tables here. Um, this table has to do with the percentage of vehicles that are turning left. Again, this is uh, right out of NCHRP 672, and that's gonna reduce your capacity some, all right? So um, like the uh, truck factor and uh, seasonal adjustment factors, you can crank these in for a little bit of fine tuning. Uh, but a lot of the intersections you'll be looking at are already substantially below the capacity of the conventional intersection. So they're going to be more than likely a no brainer for uh, replacing those with a modern roundabout, at least for today's volume of traffic. And if you don't have enough room for uh, a regular uh, full-size modern roundabout, consider a mini roundabout. Uh, of course, that is a modern roundabout that has a completely traversable central island. The entire central island is a truck apron. No landscaping or signs or anything else except a low dome, preferably colorized and texturized for visibility as your central island. Um, surprisingly, uh, with many roundabout has a reasonable capacity, it may be fine for your constrained site, it could even be downtown, and you will get the bonus of pedestrian friendliness and much more safety for everybody. So keep that in mind, quick lookups here. Ken, there's a question that came in that said, at that future traffic estimate, would you build a one-laner but provide for expansion in the future? Yeah, that's exactly what I was just talking about. Um, please don't build two lanes or three lanes, most modern roundabouts, if you only need one lane uh, under today's traffic because you don't know if or when that future projected traffic will arrive. But by all means, do design the other two or even three lanes, it might be a three lane roundabout someday, uh, and buy that rent land now while it's uh, less expensive than it will be in the future and keep those utilities away and design your stormwater utilities so there'll be the least amount of expense uh, when you add one more circulating lane. And for today's one lane roundabout, that would be the inner lane uh, for the lowest speeds and the additional lanes that might be added in the future would be uh, outer circulating lanes. So yes, that, uh, that's my advice, and I think you'll get that advice from just about uh, everybody nowadays. Don't overbuild the roundabouts uh, today for tomorrow's traffic. Um, not only will you have a little higher speeds, which is undesirable, but you will more than likely have more fender benders. Um, it's so better to stick uh, with a one-lane roundabout as long as that will handle the traffic that you have, okay? So uh, we're gonna look, look quick at some of the places where you could use a modern roundabout. For example, this is um, a transition zone, uh, a demarcation to go from uh, one district to another. That's a CRA district in the uh, background, a redevelopment district. Uh, this this particular roundabout has an obelisk, which is brilliantly uh, uplighted at night. It looks great. It celebrates East Tampa, uh, formed in, uh, founded in 1911. Uh, it's great to have the mayor uh, and other uh, folks, and especially people from the impacted community, to give speeches and have a ribbon cutting, maybe have a party with 
some uh, food and so on and so forth and have your uh, local media there celebrate the opening of your modern roundabouts. Um, so again, I'm going to show you by way of versatility and there are different places you could be putting roundabouts. This is the middle school. I personally have uh, been PM, for, uh, owner's PM for two modern roundabouts at um, K-12 schools, one at this middle school and one at a a elementary school, both were one lane mono roundabouts and they worked out uh, really well. The low speeds are great uh, for safety and also the crossing guards um, find it much easier to control, they tell me, both the kids and the parents who are not always well behaved when they drop off and pick up their kids. So there's the crossing guard that I interviewed, and I interviewed several others. Try to interview the card. Guard, the same guard who had duty at the same school before an intersection was converted to a modern roundabout. So I say uh, school locations can be okay, and there are quite a few in the United States now at K-12 schools, and also there are quite a few at colleges and universities where they make great gateways into the campus, and there are even some on the campuses, at, uh, for example, at Stanford University uh, outside San Francisco in Palo Alto, California. Uh, they make great gateways for um, institutional districts, shopping centers, uh, special districts, arts districts, and the uh, roundabout can be adorned as a gateway with the mascot of the university in the middle or whatever, and that can get you some badly needed support from the university or whatever district or institution it is, and don't worry, they'll pay for their mascot. Um, you need to think it through, of course, but modern roundabouts can go well uh, close to railroad tracks. In fact, the engineer for CSX uh, opened, uh, welcomed our proposal here with uh, open arms, and uh, we didn't know the reason, but he told us. When the gates come down, you see the gates here and here, some drivers will go around the gate uh, and get hit by trains, and it does happen every year, and it's a terrible Ken, tragedy. Yes. A question that came in um, concerning the roundabout that was in front of the school, they were curious about how the crossing guard situation works there. Does a crossing guard get assigned to each leg, or, you know, are there... Is there just, you know, one crossing guard who's covering from the middle? They, they were curious how that works, if you do. That's a great question. Imagine this was a conventional intersection before. So one crossing, so the sidewalks were right here and right here. I should say the cross crosswalks, not sidewalks. So the crossing guard would stand here and, and, and control these two sidewalks. Uh, now that the sidewalks are displaced, back one car link since it's a one lane modern roundabout uh, for each of these the crosswalks are further back and uh, most schools elected to hire two crossing guards so the crossing guards each cover uh, one crosswalk and um, that was their decision they had the money they decided to do it um, and those crossing guards sometimes operate uh, from uh, from the curb here Sometimes the crosswalks, or the, sorry, the crossing guards operate from the central, uh, I'm sorry, from the splitter island. And sometimes the crossing guards like to walk the kids from the curb to at least as far as the splitter island or even all the way across. I saw uh, some of that at the uh, other school, the um, elementary school, and uh, I have uh, some pretty nice videos of that. So that's how it's worked out at the two uh, K-12 schools I've done. And if you have one of those in mind, um, you can get a list of all the other school K-12 schools that have them. Uh, and also, I have these videos I'd be happy to share so people can see what it's like. Thanks for that question. Um, anyway, back to CSX. Uh, he liked the idea. and. We quickly realized why. It's because uh, on impulse, drivers will go around. But he said, do you think you could extend the Splitter Island well beyond the railroad track? And we said, sure, but why? And he explained that if there's a long median, uh, drivers 
uh, are less likely on impulse to lay back from the tracks, go around the uh, the, uh, the gates. Um, so they have to make that impulse decision further back. They're less likely to, plus they're sort of trapped in the long way lane right here. They don't like that. So this costs almost nothing uh, to extend that median there, that splitter island, and it got approval from CSX. So there's some tips there. So um, think not just of um, safety and operational benefits. Uh, there are many other benefits of modern roundabouts. There are many other groups out there who uh, would like those benefits uh, if only they knew about them. And so uh, the more support you can get from other groups for your roundabout proposal, the more likely you are to actually build it. These are some of the people, the urbanists, smart growth people, active living people, Complete Street advocates particularly, uh, and environmental folks, Green Street advocates. Now, the Complete Street folks are primarily concerned, in my observation, with streets between intersections. But if you point out that, hey, you know, um, vulnerable users and uh, everybody else crosses path at intersections. So you really need to complement complete streets with complete intersections. A uh, complete street is streets that are for everyone, and a complete intersection is an intersection that's good for everyone, and that would be modern roundabouts. And point out that if you had complete streets and complete intersections, then you would have complete networks, a term I've never run into anywhere else. So uh, have that conversation with those folks and get more people on your roundabout teams. Road diets uh, are typically applied between intersections, but they can also go very, very well with modern roundabouts, very good combination. Mark Doctors at uh, Federal Highway Administration likes to say, Road diets and modern roundabouts go together like peas and carrots. So um, these groups, vulnerable users, uh, if only they knew what modern roundabouts could do for them, would like them as well. Evacuation officials and visionaries. If we have time, we'll look at a visionary example. And you've got great answers for all those people. Here's a um, very... Uh, a constrained site with the uh, Metro Rail in the background coming up from Miami. This is Coral Gables, uh, Florida. It's a Michael Waller design. Notice the central island is not round. It's elliptical shape. It's not oval shape. It's not racetrack shape. It's elliptical shape. Those are all arcs, uh, four arcs there. So, and notice that it's, uh, by the way, it's one lane here and two circulating lanes there. It is a hybrid. It has six connecting legs. You can imagine how poor the operational efficiency was when it was signalized. Plus, there's a college right behind the campus, uh, right behind the camera, so uh, there are pedestrians here as well. This is another example of an entryway roundabout into downtown uh, Avon, Colorado. Um, you can uh, celebrate the history, the culture, what matters, the local values, just like they do in Europe. Um, with your modern roundabouts, don't worry. The budget for the for the artworks is not going to come out of your roundabout budget. You don't have to know anything about art. You don't have to select the artwork or find the artist to propose artworks. The art folks will take care of all that, and they have money to pay for it. These look great Ken? in the summer. Yes. Quick question, and I think this kind of stems from a few slides back. They wanted to know what about transit, specifically BRT systems, do you have any examples of roundabouts on BRT or BRT-like transit routes? I do not with BRT. I can make a couple of general comments and I did not include a slide for that. Consider that uh, at bus stops, um, which I think is what's meant by transit here, BRT is bus rapid transit, of course. What are transit users before and after the embark and disembark. They're pedestrians and bicyclists. So bus stops need an environment that is ped bike friendly and that is a modern roundabout. As far as BRT goes, um, modern roundabouts typically are free flow uh, off peak hour and typically have a 20 or 30 percent improvement in operational efficiency at peak hour. 
So the BRT could go uh, right through the modern roundabout in the same circulating lane as everybody else. If you're interested in light rail, uh, there are some examples now in the United States where light rail goes right through the center of the roundabout, and uh, there's one in uh, outside Salt Lake City, Utah, at the uh, University of Utah campus near the stadium. It's a great example. Check it out on Google. I've watched it operate. It's it's very nice. That intersection is a roundabout, and the light rail alignment through the center of the roundabout were all designed simultaneously. So I think you're going to be okay with BRT. It will be entrained in regular traffic uh, if it uses the same circulating lanes, but um, it it could be a lot worse. It could be sitting at a red light. Thanks for that question. Great question. Anyway, um, so. Uh, modern, but there's some ski area in the background. You see if you're familiar there. Uh, so here you can also use modern roundabouts for placemaking. This is a five-legged intersection. You see at the upper right in downtown Sarasota, Florida. Uh, this one leg is one lane uh, exiting. Uh, didn't work very well as a signal, so they made it into a one-lane modern roundabout. But more than that, it's a people space now. It's not car-centric anymore. It's not dominated by vehicles. The vehicles slither by silently in the background. Don't dominate this space. They're not sitting there at the red light idling and then roaring off when the light turns green. And so this is uh, a people-dominated uh, space, a people-centric space. And uh, there's another view. By the way, here's another tip. You want to get up high to get good pictures and use a wide angle 18 millimeter lens. So you see it's a people space. Cars retreat into the background. And uh, you can even have public art, not just in the middle, but also around the periphery. So consider that uh, before the storm and after the storm, modern roundabouts operate the same, which is to say safely and efficiently. They don't have any of the things that fail as signalized intersections. So that is uh, really appealing to the evacuation folks and other folks because you don't have to have police officers here uh, at these intersections. They take care of themselves. You could say they're fail safe. So um, they're also great for access management. Victoria, remind me of when our cutoff point is, please. It is two o'clock, so you've got about 13 or so more minutes left. Oh, good. So let's uh, dip into a few other examples here. The conventional signalized intersection over time, volume builds, queues get longer, it's harder to get into a park corner property, harder to be the directions, harder to get out. Businesses fail, plus it's not a very nice place for pedestrians. It becomes a gas station. As the volumes go up, the queues go up, access goes down, customers go away, and nobody wants to invest there. Before long, you may even have dead gas stations, which are blight on that corner, blight on that intersection, and blight on the surrounding community. Let's look at some corridor examples. This is in Golden, Colorado. Uh, they didn't have any fatalities ahead of time, but I just remind you that since 2001, the Federal Highway Administration has been saying that modern roundabouts reduce fatalities by more than 90%. And a more recent study um, by Pennsylvania DOT based on 17 years of data found that modern roundabouts reduce fatalities by 100%. That's right. They have achieved vision zero at their roundabouts in Pennsylvania. And they found that serious injury crashes were also reduced by 100% and minor injury crashes by 95%. Along this corridor, uh, when they converted uh, these uh, four intersections to modern two-lane modern roundabouts, crashes were down 60% and injuries down 96%. They still have some left turn conflicts, which is not great for older folks because if they misjudge that oncoming traffic, they can be T-boned, which is a very bad outcome for anybody, all right? Let's see what happens there. Uh, so one possibility is to uh, eliminate those left turns into these big box uh, store parking lots on either side. 
And this is one of the secrets of modern roundabouts. Uh, you can uh, simply eliminate those left turns, which are hazardous. People make a nice, comfortable, safe, low-speed U-turn and now can access those uh, properties on the other side of the street safely and comfortably. By the way, in Golden, retail was down uh, badly um, because of the international economy uh, that year when these opened, but uh, their revenue went up. So this is Carmel, Indiana. They built more roundabouts uh, per capita than any other city in the United States. And uh, they actually didn't do it for safety or operational efficiency. Those were wonderful uh, ancillary benefits. They did it to improve the quality of life there. And we'll have more to say about Carmel. Uh, but let's take a look at uh, uh, Columbus, uh, Ohio. Uh, these are your fatal crashes of 2014 through 2018. And you see they've gone from 49 to 66. The trend is up and up and up every year. That's not good. Um, that's a lot of crashes per 100,000 population. And um, we would like to get that down. Of course, not all those crashes are at intersection by any means. But getting back to Carmel, Indiana, uh, let's suppose that uh, you wanted your community or your client's community to attain roundabout parity with Carmel, Indiana. Uh, and what would it take? Well, here's Carmel, Indiana in the uh, gold uh, bar. And um, they have a population of 95,000, 126 modern roundabouts. So they have 1.3 modern roundabouts per thousand population, okay? Uh, so in order to achieve the same thing, Dublin would need 69 modern roundabouts. In order to achieve roundabout parity with uh, Carmel, Indiana, Columbus would need 174 modern roundabouts. I chose these four cities because they all are, are growing very rapidly in Ohio. That's the uh, growth rate uh, in the far right column. So if you've only got uh, 10 or 20 modern roundabouts in one of these communities, uh, and you're wondering, gosh, how many uh, might we have? Well, uh, one uh, bar here in the United States, don't have to look at Europe, is Columbia, so Ohio, and by the way, uh, their crashes, including both fatals and serious injury crashes, are way, way down in Carmel, Indiana. So Carmel, Indiana says their modern roundabouts have given them a 80% reduction in injury crashes. Carmel says they're saving 24,000 gallons of gasoline per roundabout every year, or a total of 2.9 million gallons of gasoline annually. Uh, so this is uh, all reasons to consider a modern roundabout. We've got six minutes, so let's see if we have a couple more examples here. I think we do. This is pretty cool if you haven't seen it before. This is a project that was built several years ago. Bird Rock is on the west coast of the United States, uh, just north of San Diego, right there. Uh, okay, there's a close-up. That's what it looks like. They built modern roundabouts along a corridor. This is a corridor project. This is what La Jolla Boulevard used to look, look like. It was looking north, and on the left is the uh, Pacific Ocean. That's what it looks like. was looking like today. Uh, pedestrians had a long way to cross. Uh, this road had to handle both coastal traffic as well as local traffic. Um, it took a long time to cross that street. You mentioned, I recall earlier, I mentioned that crossing exposure is significant. So they built all these roundabouts along that corridor and a few in the adjacent neighborhoods as well and to handle cut through traffic. So there's no avoiding the roundabouts. And what they came up was this. They see this skateboarder decides he'll just enter the circulating lane uh, himself. And this. There's our skateboarder again. Okay, no problem keeping up with traffic. You notice it is a little bit congested. They decided that was okay because this is a totally different street than what they had. So which would you rather have? So think big, think corridor wide, okay?
let's see. Now here's a visionary concept. Um, this is Charleston on the left, and on the right is the community of Mount Pleasant. It's a bedroom community. Johnny Dobbs uh, Boulevard uh, is, uh, was proposed to be raised. It's already cleaving Mount Pleasant in two, but at least it's at grade. But the proposal was to raise it, All right? There we go, and that's Charleston in the distance, uh, looking to the northwest. So we know from, this is my hometown, that when you raise a roadway, uh, you get these um, underpasses where nobody wants to be, even in a car, and certainly not after dark. This uh, looks so awful. I uh, took a picture on the sunny side, and it was just as bad. Uh, and if you're a female or you're pushing a uh, baby carriage or otherwise encumbered, or if you're an older person, you may even less want to walk under there, especially after dark. So um, Victor Dover, who's uh, one of the thought leaders, along with engineer Rick Hall um, in the Congress of New Urbanism, came up with a visionary concept uh, for Johnny Dobbs Boulevard in which it would remain at grade. Uh, and now it would connect the two sides of Mount Pleasant instead of cleaving it in half even more than it already is. And they would do that by creating a European-style boulevard, including modern roundabouts. And so instead of what I showed you in my hometown, you would have something like this. Unfortunately, the vision was not embraced by the leadership. But still, think big and have visions. Well, let's see. That concludes today's presentation. Uh, are there any further questions? There aren't, Ken, um, but I wanted to add that I did put a link to the registration for your next webinar, which is in about a half an hour, in the chat box if there's anyone on here who didn't already register for the 2.30 session on metering. Um, you can definitely still register for that. And we want to thank you for your time today. It was a great comparison between Carmel and Columbus and New Albany and Dublin. I believe you had on there, correct? Yeah. You had Hilliard on there yeah. too, didn't you? So I'm sorry. I've already, I said, didn't you have Hilliard on there too? Yes, I did have Hilliard. And if everybody doesn't know, you should. That's where Betty Champ is, the engineer. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's just been a tremendous asset to uh, the nationwide roundabout community as well as to her, her own hometown of Hilliard. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the fact that, you know, Carmel was able to experience, you said, an 80% reduction in fatalities mm -hmm. at their intersections that they converted over to roundabouts is just tremendous. You know, I, I, we have to go after these fixes that are going to give us the big drops in fatalities if we're ever going to get to zero deaths on the roadways. So I would encourage everybody take another look at that chart when I send out a link to the recording. And let's see, you know, aspirationally, even if you're not in one of those cities, wherever you are, what can you do to, you know, look at getting more roundabouts put in at intersections? So thanks so much. And if you would like to participate in the next webinar, we would be happy to have you. The link is there in the chat box or you can find it on our LTAP website. And we'll talk to everybody in about a half an hour, hopefully. Thanks, Ken. You're welcome.